If you're not already using Docker or other containers, it won't be long. But container awesomeness comes with new security risks. We pull apart the container stack to show you where. Welcome to Threat Actions This Week, the show where we look at the latest threats, tech, and actions your organization can take. Today's top security talent share their insights with you. And I'm joined by three experts in the container space. Opening off with John Morello, CTO at Twistlock, co-author of NIST Application Container Security 800-190. A must read, and in fact, it'll be partially the template we'll use for today's discussion. John joins us out of Baton Rouge. Welcome, John. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. And Alfredo Hickman, he's the manager of product engineering, Rackspace Managed Security, conducted research with SANS on the efficacy of intrusion detection for containers. In the show notes and later on, I will give you the complete title of his research. Well worth the read. He joins out of San Antonio. How are you doing, Alfredo? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good day, and everybody, and thank you for having me. Not at all. Again, thanks very much for joining us. And Kelman Mayhew, he is the security program manager at SciComp. He is in the weeds of securing large-scale deployments. Appreciate the time, Kelman. Hey, thanks for having me on. Now, I believe you are up in Toronto, Canada today, correct? That is correct. Recovering from uh, May 2 okay. That's Victoria Day for everyone else around the globe. A nice long weekend for Canadians. Well, we start off the show looking at the threat radar and what vulnerabilities, threats, and otherwise that organizations need to be looking out for today. Alfredo, from your perspective, what are you seeing out there? I think something that's been top of mind, you've mentioned before here recently with throw hammer, net hammer, and the derivatives thereof. This is something that's been top of mind for a lot of our peers in the managed services industry. We operate managed security services on top of the world's leading public cloud. So we're partnered with Microsoft Azure, with AWS, US with a Google Cloud platform and, and then Rackspace Global dedicated infrastructure around the world and kind of coming right off the heels of, of Spectre and Meltdown and responding to that with vulnerabilities like Throwhammer, we really need to be looking at the infrastructure that services our overlaying products and services to make sure that those are properly secured and maintained and that we're able to have the visibility into these vulnerabilities and make sure that we're providing secure services for our customers. So definitely been top of mind lately. How are you feeling about attackers' potential ability to exploit Rowhammer remotely through Throwhammer? Is this is this for real right now, or what should organizations be thinking about? So I think it is for real. To be prepared and to be aware is critical. To kind of key off of Dr. Eric Cole, prevention is nice, detection is a must. Having that capability ability to be aware and detect and mitigate those kind of risks is a prudent move from a service manager's perspective. However, it's not nothing that we would want to incite kind of panic across our customer base or anything of this nature. You know, we especially, as I mentioned before, coming off the heels of our response to, to Spectre and Meltdown are in a really good position to kind of mitigate that risk. Makes sense. And John, from a twist lock perspective, what are you guys seeing? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges that customers are facing right now is we've seen a, such a huge growth in adoption of containers and cloud native technologies that a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals at those organizations that historically haven't worked in that space are now being challenged to go out there and help secure a containerized environment instead of workloads that they may not have a lot of familiarity with. You know, if your background has been using, you know, traditional physical firewalls and protecting virtual machines and so forth, not just the technology stack is different, but really the operational, the people and process side tends to be very different with cloud native and containers. And as it becomes more and more of a mainstream technology, it becomes a, a bigger challenge for people that may not have had that background and skill set prior. One just recent anecdotal point for to that was that last year at Kubernetes Con in Europe, there were something like 400 attendees and, and this year there were 5,000 attendees. So the number of people that are involved in this space and they're increasingly being given the responsibility to secure this stack is growing. And I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons why we created the NIST Special Pub to codify that guidance, to give people a real independent examination of what the risks are and what the countermeasures they can use to mitigate those risks are. I'm looking forward to getting right in the midst of that in just a couple minutes. And Kalman, from your standpoint, what are you seeing out there? The biggest thing I feel that as an industry we're challenged with is we have to rethink how we've done security, how we focus, where we applied it, shedding the old ideas and old concepts. And if you take a deeper look, I think there's so much more we can do. It's just we, we can't get stuck in our old ways. Completely agree. So, continue 
Containers give me portability. They allow my code to run without worrying about dependencies, libraries, etc. They underpin CICD, continuous integration, continuous development, and microservices. But like John is saying, with the advances in any technology, it provides those who would do us harm new ways to execute their craft. So I wanted to know what the average North American thinks about our chances, given the cat and mouse gameplay that we see in containers are just adding to that yet again. Simple question launched to 300 North Americans. When will cybersecurity professionals get the upper hand to protect your personal information from cyber criminals? Gave them a few different options. One is the good guys are already winning, just to be optimistic. Two years, five years, and 10 years by the time they'll figure it out, or never. So from a U.S. perspective, what do you guys think? The good guys are already winning. Do you think anyone would actually click on that? Probably not very many people. I would probably say that the defenders and the blue team are, are typically behind the curve, so to say, in responding to kind of adversary threats and attacks. Security, especially in the enterprise, is oftentimes a maintaining of the status quo or using established techniques, processes, and tools to maintain um, a certain sense of security or maintain a certain threshold of risk. Where on the adversary side, I mean, oftentimes you, you just have to be successful in executing that one attack or exploiting that one vulnerability to gain a foothold into the enterprise. What I've witnessed, at least from my perspective, has been the attacker precipitating the growth and response to those kind of adversaries techniques and kind of sharpening the sword in that perspective. Only 20% in the U.S. say the good guys are already winning 22% in Canada. Those who will say never, so they're completely pessimistic about this, half of Americans, 49% in the U.S. say that we'll never win this war. 58%, so almost 6 out of 10 Canadians are very pessimistic about our odds. In fact, as we get older, the more likely we are to say never. So we get more pessimistic, I guess, as we get a little bit older. All right, so let's get right into the heart of the topic that we're looking at today. And there's three ways to think about container security, the layers of the stack from host all the way to application, the life cycle from planning all the way to disposition. And then what's the use case? Is it being used in development? Is it being used in production? Alfredo, you had a really interesting quote in your research. You write, the means and methods for securing container environments are young and not evolving as rapidly as the container technologies themselves. Do you think that maybe we're starting to narrow that gap or is that gap continuing to widen? I'm sure John's going to want to weigh in on this one too. <laughs> I'm sure John would. And I think from closely working in the industry and monitoring some of the key players that are working in this space, I would say that I think that gap is narrowing a little bit. However, obviously, we have kind of the, a critical mass of, of adopters that are really getting into the market now, leveraging containerized technologies, developing new use cases and kind of solving some of their fleet management struggles with orchestration technologies and the like. So I think from that perspective, the ecosystem is developing rapidly and evolving very, very quickly. And typically what we've seen in a lot of security generationally has been kind of a, a reactive response to the, the evolution of the technologies in question, right? In this case, I mean, we see every single day a new containerized use case is new players entering the market, existing players entering the market, new to new runtimes and new orchestration mechanisms that are coming to play. So I think once again, it becomes this paradigm where from a security perspective, you have to be a master of everything or at least try to be very strategic in what you develop against to get kind of efficacy from a security value perspective, right? And risk mitigation perspective. I think we are narrowing, but it's definitely a very fast race. Containers, like most technologies, are uh, are amoral in the sense that they, they're neither good nor bad. They're tools, and you can use those tools well, or you can use them poorly. But one thing that's interesting with containers is that they provide, I think, for really one of the first times, a real genuine opportunity to increase the level of automation that security tools can use 
which really is critical to scaling security to the kind of the, the rapid level of innovation and just like the amount of things, entities, applications and services and so forth that organizations have. We talk a lot about this notion of like there being three fundamental characteristics of containers that are applicable for that. One of them is the fact that containers are very declarative, right? You know, a container is built from an image and image is composed of layers. Layers are described in a Docker file, which is very different than a very opaque kind of virtual machine like a VMDK or a virtual hard drive in which you don't really know exactly what's in it. It's very hard to have software accurately understand what's inside of that virtual machine. Secondly, containers are, are typically operated in a very predictable manner. So whatever you have that container doing, whatever that image is supposed to do, it should do the same thing throughout its natural life. It should not start off running a web server and later also run a database. It should not start off running a web server and later run Netcat or InMap or something like that. And that predictability allows us to be able to create a model for what is normal, what, the, what that container should usually be doing, and then to automatically look for anomalies relative to what that model predicts. So unlike in past systems where you as a security professional would have to go in and say, here's a list of all the things this app shouldn't do and have to maintain this list in a very static manner. While it is a different technology and that technology is not always going to be the, the simplest thing for people to understand if they don't have experience with it yet, the fact that it has these characteristics really enables a different approach for security and one I think that, that solves a lot of sins of the past that requires so much manual effort. So what we'll do is we'll get into the layers of the stack. Before we get there, I want to take it back a step. And Alfredo, you wrote about, and this list may not be entirely exhaustive, but it gives you an overview behind the problem set of securing containers. And so binding containers to non-standard network ports, deploying application workloads dynamically over distributed hosts, integrating rapidly evolving application code on containers in production, having specific container instances provisioned for only a brief period of time. So each one of those areas starts to contribute to a different state of security. So my security posture inherent in those various elements winds up changing. Kelman, from your perspective, what are you seeing? I will say there's one thing I really love about containers from a security perspective, and it's the, the ephemeral programmable nature of them. It allows me to actually create a security design that is not so much worried about the risks of threats and attacks and vulnerabilities, but is focused on you know removing persistence or the ability for people to get a foothold. Like You might get the foothold, but as you try to do something with it, uh, your container blows up, disappears, and a new one's back with a no and good image. Simple things like there's no such thing as a reboot with a container. It gets destroyed and redeployed every time. Use one for a bit and throw them away. When you put in that dynamic, it really does change basically the level of impact, I feel. This, the attacks are still going on. But as far as the footholds and where we can get with them, I'm really scratching my head going, now, am I really at risk like the way I was before? Again, assuming you've taken the time and, and tuned all your containers, built your layers appropriately, et cetera. How are you guys seeing containers predominantly being used? Is this, you know, in a cloud native microservice based architecture, or do you see organizations trying to rehost and modernize applications? Our larger enterprise customers that are trying to modernize their IT and their applications as a part of digital transformation and the like, we are seeing customers wanting to adopt leaner, more cost-effective architectures, a consolidation of services, which interestingly enough, you know, when a customer looks at their current status quo web application architecture and then kind of maps that to what it would look like in a microservices construct, I think initially there's kind of a shock in, in terms of the density of containers and containerized services that would have to be created to support that or or to get an equivalence, but I think when folks really start understanding what fleet management, what the speed of development and launching code into production and the agility that they get from that, I think they're pleasantly surprised. So John, when you guys are securing them, what are you seeing from your perspective in terms of the use cases? We have customers that are both cloud native in the sense of smaller organizations that started off using containers from the very beginning, but also some very large, very well-established organizations, you know, some financial services customers that are literally hundreds of years old at this point. The larger and older the more likely they are to have, uh, you know, decades of legacy applications they need to move along. But also, it doesn't mean that they don't also at the same time have net new applications that they're building specifically for containers that are being built from the beginning to be a microservices type architecture. So I did a talk this year at KubeCon specifically around using containerization as a mechanism to improve security, using that same 
kind of basic approach that I talked about earlier. And I, I kind of expected that it may not be a highly attended talk because the audience at KubeCon is typically like very focused on lower level technology stuff. But the uh, the room was actually very packed and we had lots of questions and people wanting to talk afterwards. And it really kind of made me feel like there are people are beginning to realize that um, there are some advantages to using containers from a security standpoint and that going through that process for being able to, uh, to deploy containers and to put their existing applications within them actually can be a, a valuable way to improve the overall security application, even if they're not able to take advantage of everything else that containers can provide. Kelman, you've been a pretty big advocate of that as well. Anything to add there? I think that's an excellent direction we can take with containers. I'm speaking as a former traditional networking guy, when you really get to learn, for example, container networks and how you can control them, this is the micro segmentation we've been dreaming of. Matter of fact, I call it atomic segmentation when you layer in the way different ways you can exchange data through mounts or hybrid tunnels or sockets or, you know, there's so many different ways and you can even cycle through them as you move data through the infrastructure. I think we're really scratching the surface on the things we can do and the things we have still to learn. John, you outlined the risks and the countermeasures across five layers, the image, registry, orchestrator, container, and the host. Maybe we can deconstruct it a little bit. For us, the reason we split it out like that in the special pub was to be able to give people a more consistent kind of layered model to think about the space because I, there's a lot of confusion I've seen with people that come from a more traditional like VM-centric background, like, like pretty much everybody that's been in IT has. Because I think in a lot of ways, the media has made containers into something that are not. You see a lot of articles about containers versus virtual machines and are containers going to replace virtual machines? The reality is that like, they're, they're very different technologies. And they're designed to be more complementary than anything else. I mean, pretty much every customer that we have uses containers inside of VMs, and that's a, a very normal and natural operating pattern. So the reason we built that approach and, to, and took the approach within the special pub was to be able to give people that layered mental model for, for how containers kind of fit in with what they already have. Because containerization isn't about throwing away everything that you've already got within your environment, both from a technology stack as well as like a people and process standpoint, but it's really just like an additional layer of abstraction above the OS that you've already had in your VMs. So by helping people think about that in a way that's more accurate in terms of, of what they actually are going to be using, I think makes it easier for them to understand what they need to do to secure it. So it's not about saying like containers are fundamentally different than VMs and so everything that you used in the past is no longer relevant. It's really about saying it's an additional layer on top of that. So how can you combine that with the other things that you may need to be able to do to secure the rest of your stack? Like to Alfredo's point, you know, it's not... You know, it's, it, containers are kind of like the top layer of this stack, but there's still all the other things that you have in your cloud environment that, that are still equally important. You still need to patch your host OS. You still need to have good firewall rules into your data center. None of that stuff is completely eliminated by containers. It's just an additional capability that sits on top of it. So if you think about some of the major gaps, some of the, the biggest problems that you see organizations running into, whether it's from a registry standpoint or orchestrator or what have you, what problems do you see organizations running into? Well, I think that some of the biggest ones that people have, at least the initial problems that they see, are the lack of visibility into their containers and images because their traditional tools are not aware of or just do not have, know how to deal with the data as it's represented from a container standpoint. One really clear example of that and something that most of our customers experience very quickly is you may have a registry where you've got hundreds or thousands of images and without having a tool that you can use to assess the security posture of those images, you may have literally thousands of critical vulnerabilities that you're basically blind to. And so there's some basic things that are just around like visibility and awareness. Like how do I make sure that my configuration is secure? How do I implement the requirements or, or at least the recommendations, I guess, that are in the special pub and in the CIS benchmarks and so forth? How do I find and understand vulnerabilities within my environment? Those are kind of the basic table stakes. And sometimes people get too wrapped up into the you know, the more esoteric science fiction kind of hacking scenarios that, you know, somebody might be able to do if they do some some amazing kinds of tricks within your application. But the reality for most organizations is that you've already got such a soft target for just like unpatched yet public vulnerabilities that until you address that, it's, it's almost not worth spending time on the higher level problems. And so one of the things I always recommend to people and you see it in the special pub is, 
focus first on at least getting a grasp of what are your risks out there in the images that you are running. Because until you go and at least fix like the critical vulnerabilities that you have in your application, almost nothing else you do even matters because there's always going to be that conduit into your environment to abuse that environment and you know usurp control of it if the applications themselves have high level vulnerabilities. So getting a handle on that and getting a handle on that early, like in the CI process at the registry before the image is ever deployed is a really critical aspect of doing us effectively with containers. So let me pull on those threads a little bit more with a quote from Alfredo. And you say, defense in depth is still critical to security. No one security technology nor single platform can detect all the attacks, vulnerabilities, and threats. Sort of paraphrase, you assert that reliance on tools alone is unrealistic and unwise. You do go on to give some counsel there in terms of threat hunting, centralized log management, uh, integrated security across the CI CD pipeline. So what would you add to what John was just talking about? I think, as John mentioned, a lot of folks, they're very captivated by the science fiction and, and what the possibilities for kind of next level exploits and uber elite hacks and everything else could be against their environments. The truth of the matter is kind of a little bit more down to earth, right? Asset management, dependency management in the CI process, really having visibility from an instrumentation perspective on your infrastructure, knowing what's exposed to the internet, making sure that your security staff is trained and knowledgeable in these knowledge and proficiency areas kind of goes a long way to making sure that you can kind of mitigate risk and in having more effective security program. So defense in depth is still important. Asset management is critical and making sure that you have the right tools to extend and to enable your security program is quite critical. We see a lot of customers that are coming to us now that are kind of getting more involved into adopting cloud native technologies or containerized microservice architectures and the like. And, um, you know, they, they've gone through various iterations of applying traditional tools to these new uh, use cases and kind of having varying degrees of efficacy with their results and coming back and us saying, hey, how do we rethink about security in this kind of new paradigm? How do we evolve our existing program to better secure these use cases and these deployments? As John was mentioning, it's not kind of replacing your old techniques, tools, or, or programs and people, but kind of evolving to meet this new reality. Not unlike what virtualization did into the traditional IT paradigm over a decade ago. It's very much a natural progression there. Couldn't agree more. And we've looked at the layers of the stack, so from image all the way down to the host. But let's look at it from a life cycle standpoint. And in the special pub, NIST 800-190, you guys looked at it from a lifecycle standpoint, which is really helpful. Let's combine initiate and plan into one and just take some of the key areas there, John, and see what you might want to add. Some of the things that you were recommending is look at the implications on broader security policies around vulnerability management and forensics. You talk about educating across the CI CD pipeline, as we've been mentioning, and you talk about knowing your incident response actions from a virtual network, uh, from a file system, from a memory standpoint, there's a number of different implications when we start to get into a containerized environment. From a planning perspective, what else would you add to that? Probably the most important thing that a security organization needs to understand when their larger IT organization begins using containers is that the responsibility for security is shifted further upstream than they've probably ever dealt with before. In the sense that in the past, your development team would build something, they would hand it over to some team that were operators. Um, those operators would then deploy it, they would manage it over its lifetime, they would probably be the ones that would scan it for vulnerabilities and other issues, they would deploy you know, some kind of runtime defense software to it, and that when there were updates, they would be the ones to deploy those updates. One of the biggest fundamental differences from an operational standpoint with containers is that that responsibility for securing the app almost has to happen within the development phase by the developers themselves, because again, that notion of containers being these you know, effectively immutable objects, they're just running an image, you are not going to update the container after it's been deployed, means that your developers need to understand or remediate those problems before those images ever leave their environment. And that's why we think that having that integration into the CI CD flow is so critical because 
If you don't have that, then by definition, you are always going to be playing defense. You're always going to be reactive. You know, an image is deployed. It's got vulnerabilities. You have to go in there and clean it up or tell the developer they need to fix it. Really, the right way to do security in this cloud native space is to ensure that those quality gates are both enforced at production, but also in the build process. So you can have a rule like if this image has vulnerabilities that are critical or higher for which a vendor fix is available, fail the build. Force the developer to fix that problem before it ever progresses out of their hands. And that's a really powerful advantage that containers give you from a security standpoint because you can fix problems really before they ever occur. So Kalman, how confident are you that the developers around you are going to be able to carry the ball forward from a security perspective? Well, un unfortunately, I've seen enough customers running, you know, 40 gig container images and storing their credentials in GitHub and Docker Hub for us to have to be realistic. There is a serious lack of knowledge and, you know, even experience in this area. My hope is that they focus more on the structure and the build of the system and actually less on the threats, believe it or not. I, I spent most of my life chasing down incoming threats. And now I'm, I'm kind of taking the look in and saying, well, how do we change this mutability? I love the container file system where each group or security group is, is responsible for a layer and a protection and validation of it. And you can have that build along the flow and then out it goes. So again, nothing's perfect, but we actually have a programmable way to respond now and essentially build the security we dreamed of in, in a way that somebody's not going to plug in the wrong port or somebody's not going to you know, move their server around or, or reconnect or disconnect this. You can actually have that level of control and visibility now question is, will people take the time to really relearn this? I run into a lot of people who have, you know, 20 years experience and simply want to repeat what they did before. And that, that will actually make containers far more dangerous than what they should be. If it's infrastructure as code, then why can't I program it to respond to security events, you know, practically? What should I be thinking about when I'm thinking about key management, when I'm thinking about how my container is processing, acting upon critical data within my organization? First, I think from our perspective comes a, an understanding and a visibility of the architecture. And uh, I think as you were mentioning, key management and all the other components and dependencies that tie into those systems. So your keys, authentication, your repositories, your code repos, things of this nature, really understanding where your valuables live and then kind of developing and adapting your security posture to secure those. That, that I think is a good starting place. Well, that leads into the implementation phase. And John, you talk a lot about authentication, authorization, resource access. Can you talk a little bit about identity with respect to containers? Identity is both directly related to containers and also sort of outside the scope of what most containers are focused on solving. And what I mean by that is that containers themselves don't require like a new identity stack. Most of the things that you're going to use to manage them and to secure them like Docker or Kubernetes or Twistlock for that matter, already will integrate with the existing identity providers you've already got, you know, SAML and Active Directory and so forth. So think of containers as like less about, I need a new way to do identity. But the thing that's more interesting is how do you identify the machine identities, the systems and the, and the services that you're running in those containers in a way that's relevant from a forensic standpoint, because no longer do you have the notion of, hey, this virtual machine was present and I can see who logged into it and you know I can see who deployed it and so forth. With containers, because those entities are much more ephemeral, it's a lot diff more difficult to kind of associate a, a system identity with the things that are running in that environment. And that I think is one of the bigger challenges from a security standpoint is, is being able to correlate the activities that occur within a container with some kind of chain of custody of who created it and who deployed it and what happened afterwards, it's really difficult to do that because they're so non-durable. That's probably, I think, the biggest challenge with containers and identity is not so much the people identities, but system identities that really change quite a bit when you deal with these entities that are so short-lived. So that runs headlong into one of the major areas of risk and consideration that you raised in this special pub. You talk about incident response and you talk about the roles and the owners and the sensitivity levels and what you need to start to think about from an IR perspective. Now, you've written about it. I think, Alfredo, you touched a little bit on it as well. From your perspective, what do you see? As John was mentioning, the ephemeral nature of the container lifecycle and how quickly you can provision and deprovision both hosts and containerized instances and the like kind of make IR very difficult. But gaining a good analytical understanding of adversary behavior 
within those environments and against those those applications gives us the ability to craft um, more effective um, defensive measures, right, and mitigate those attacks, understanding threat sources, understanding what attackers are going from, understanding how they're collecting information from the network from a reconnaissance perspective, and then kind of mitigating those as much as possible at the network and application layer. So through the life cycle, we've covered plan. We've talked a little bit about that, about implementation, about maintenance. And Alfredo, you raise the last area of the life cycle that we want to consider, and that's around disposing of the container. When we think about that, we want to think about records management. We want to think about data retention and think about how long we're going to store that data for from a compliance standpoint. Do we need to terminate that data? Do we need to keep that data for a longer period of time? When we think about the ephemeral nature of containers and we think about that from a records management data retention standpoint, John, from your perspective, um, what are you seeing there that uh, organizations should be thinking about one of the things that's different is that logging needs to be external from the entity itself i think a lot of times that's been relied upon probably not as a best practice but relied upon nevertheless and that you know people would would have their vm for example logging data to you know to a local syslog socket or to uh, a event viewer in windows or whatever it may be and didn't really have a real viable enterprise way to collect and centralize that data with containers because all of those things are so ephemeral and non-stateful the only choice, the only way that you can collect that data in a reliable fashion for forensics purposes is to have it outside of the container. And the good news is there's lots of different tools that, that exist for that, lots of different logging drivers and approaches that can be used. But uh, that's one thing that may not be obvious to a lot of people, but it is nonetheless very important for from the standpoint of being able to report on and understand what occurs within your environment. We've covered off the layers of the stack. We've covered off the life cycle and we've talked about a number of the different issues that organizations are going to be running into. When we think about it from a solution standpoint, are there solutions that each of you have found that you found very helpful in terms of being able to deal with the myriad issues that we've identified today? So uh, I will have to put a plug and this is not a, this is not, you know, because John is on the line with us here. Part of my responsibility is assessing and kind of keeping track of, of key players that operate in the various security arenas that we are responsible for working in. And uh, honestly, I found Twistlock to be probably the leader in that space and a company that we found very attractive from a solutions perspective. Nice ringing endorsement. And John, from your perspective. Well, uh, clearly I would say uh, Twistlock is, is, is the leader in the space and somebody to uh, to, to stay on top of for it. In, in all honesty, I think that the, the really interesting piece here is that there's so much opportunity, not just for us, but for other organizations to build on those those characteristics I talked about earlier and to help organizations really improve their overall security as they adopt containers. It's a really exciting thing just from a security professional standpoint. From my background, you know, I haven't been doing containers my entire life. My whole career has really been focused around security. And I think that is a, a really exciting difference that you haven't seen with any of the other technology waves that have come through during my own career that, that can containers really enable. Um, so I hope as an industry, we capitalize on that opportunity and, and really take advantage of it. Kelman, from your perspective. Actually, I would echo the same thing. I, th I think we can do some amazing things with containers if, you know, we, we almost take a step back and recognize that maybe we don't have all the answers. And if we plow ahead, try some designs, they're ephemeral. So, you know, we try a hundred different ways of crashing and breaking them. But I really think, you know, we could take an actual strong handle on security. I can't stop the threats. They're always going to be hammering in my door. But if I start taking away the persistence and the existence of data and stripping away the value uh, proposition of, you know, for example, microservice, I think we could actually all be a little bit better. So we've come a long way today. We started with the threat radar, got a little bit more on what's happening from a throw hammer perspective and other threats out there. We've gone deep into containers. And now the final piece of the actions that your organization should be considering this week. Mine are simple. I've got two of them. Number one is read. Container intrusions, assessing the efficacy of intrusion detection and analysis methods for Linux container environments. I will definitely post a link to that within the show notes. That's uh, Alfredo Hickman's work. And then, of course, NIST Application Container Security Guide. That's 800-190. John Morello, co-author of that. Have a read through both of those. They're quite good in terms of illuminating a number of the issues we've been talking about today. They go 
deeper into those various risks and some of the countermeasures that you want to think about from an organization standpoint. Absolutely have a look at both of those. Kelman, what do you want to leave folk with this week? Have fun putting things in containers, but please, please stop storing your credentials and your keys and your passwords in Docker Hub. I don't think people realize how easy it is to scrape down images and search for, uh, you know, just some things like credential files. So it's the little basics that are still going to rip us apart. So let's not forget those. Some good advice, John. I would definitely echo that as, as one takeaway. We also, for your listeners might find interesting, we did a, a session at DockerCon last year where we talked about how we've seen in the wild abuse of open, unauthenticated registries for attackers to be able to inject their own crypto miners and to be able to use that as a way for their victims to be mining coin on their behalf by simply compromising the images in their registry. So doing the basics, uh, is, is definitely key. You know, don't store secrets and images, update critical vulnerabilities, and make sure that your registry requires authentication if it's connected to the internet, especially. Never underestimate the cleverness of the attackers. My goodness. And Alfredo, from your perspective, what actions do you want organizations to take away this week? Yeah, I would say for organizations that are moving into containerizing their workloads and, and kind of developing on top of these cloud native platforms, good on you. For those that are not, you know, get in the game. This field is, uh, is young. There is a great room for opportunity and, and value to be created for new and innovative solutions to be developed. So get in there and build the future. Kelman Mayhew from SciComp. How do people reach you? Uh, you can catch me on Twitter at Kelman. Okay. And anything that you want to plug this week, anything that you, uh, any conferences, what have you, they're going to be attending or rather speaking at, I think. Um, actually, you know, I don't have anything planned to in the short term. I, I'm f- fairly, you know, heads down work, but, uh, Definitely uh, look forward to catching everybody at Sector on uh, around September, t- October time frame. Absolutely. Great conference up in Toronto, Canada. John Morello, how can people reach you? We can be found at, uh, at Twistlock Team on Twitter. You can also visit our website at uh, twistlock.com. Okay. And anything that uh, you want folk to be aware of? Yeah, we're at lots of different conferences. We were just speaking at KubeCon. I'm going to be doing a session at DockerCon coming up with uh, Maruja Sapaya, who is the co-author of the special pub from NIST, uh, as well as some folks from Docker uh, there as well. It'd be a great chance to uh, catch up and be happy to meet any of the listeners that would like to talk about the special pub more detail. Fantastic. Thanks for the offer of that. Uh, Alfredo Hickman, how do people reach you? I'm at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Alfredo Hickman. And then please catch me on SANS Stormcast and uh, SANS webinars. I have one coming up at the end of the month on threat intelligence driven security operations, um, which should be really fun. And there you have it. Threat actions this week. Recorded May the 22nd, 2018. We'll see you again next week.